we are already familiar with the Josephson effect, both its static and dynamic versions. In this tutorial, we will talk about the practical implementation and characterization of Josephson junctions. Let's assume you have managed to fabricate a Josephson junction. You have also access to a cryo-free cooling system or liquid helium. Before cooling your junction down, you have bonded it to conducting twisted pairs, being careful not to destroy it by some unwanted electrostatic discharge. Ideally, your twisted pair should be filtered against high-frequency noise. Now you need to characterize your junction electrically, and you have two options for that. If you prefer to use a voltage bias, you will better use the semiconductor model to understand what is going on. Let's start the measurement at zero applied voltage, and let's assume, for simplicity, that we are at zero temperature, with no available quasi-particles. If, for some reason, there would be an additional phase bias, Cooper pair tunneling will take place and supercurrent will arise, even at zero voltage. However, in normal circumstances, you do not have a phase source in your lab, so probably you will not be able of seeing such current. Nevertheless, since you are using a real-world voltage source, you will find a similar but not exactly equal process. An ideal voltage source should have zero output impedance, right? But real voltage sources have a very small but non-zero output impedance. When you try to voltage bias an object like a Josephson junction that has truly zero resistance using a real-world voltage source, you will inevitably apply a small current. Current will grow up to the maximum allow value, that is I sub zero. This is the DC Josephson effect, consequence of direct tunneling of Cooper pairs. Once the critical current is reached, the junctions will dissipate, behaving as a normal resistor with finite resistance, probably much larger than the output impedance of your voltage source that will become now capable of voltage bias in your junction. Under increasing voltage bias, the Fermi level at one side of the junction will rise with respect to the other. We will be entering into the realm of the second Josephson equation that tells us that the phase difference increases with time, yielding a supercurrent that oscillates at almost 500 GHz per millivolt. Such high-frequency current is normally not measurable by conventional current sensors, and therefore you will only observe its time average that equals zero. If you continue increasing the voltage, you will arrive to the point at which breaking of Cooper pairs occurs and channeling of quasi-particles is allowed yielding the observation of a net DC current that dissipates heat and has therefore a slow characteristic of a normal metal resistor. You have a second possibility to characterize your sample, current bias. As you increase the applying current from zero, the junction will allow from, for electron transport without dissipation, resulting into zero voltage at your voltmeter. Once the critical current I sub zero is reached, the Josephson junction transits to the dissipative state, and a voltage drop will develop. This voltage difference equals two times the energy gap, in order to allow for Cooper pair breaking and quasi-particle tunneling. From this moment on, the junction will behave as a conventional resistor, with slope given by its normal state resistance. Now, something remarkable happens when you decrease the current from the dissipative state. As you reach again I sub zero, the voltage does not drop down but keeps constant at two times the superconducting energy gap until the current is set back to zero. This large hysteresis is due to the fact that Josephson junctions are large capacitors. Under these circumstances, the dynamics of the phase is much faster than the charging speed of the capacitor. In this regime, the junction has a huge inertia and the phase continues varying with time at a speed given by two times the energy gap. This behavior can be understood using the resistively and capacitively shunted junction model, shortened as RCSJ model, representing the displacement current by a capacitor and the quasi-particle by a resistance. We can devise an equivalent circuit for the junction. The resulting equation is equivalent to that of a particle moving on a tilted washboard potential, with the capacitance being the mass of the particle, 
the inverse of the resistance representing the damping of the motion, and the average tilt of the washboard being proportional to the bias current. Notice here that in tunnel junctions, the resistive channel is strongly nonlinear. This is to say, at voltages larger than two times the energy gap, the junction can be approximated by a resistor. But for voltages lower than two times the energy gap, quasi particle tunneling is forbidden, and the resistance of the junction approaches infinite, yielding zero damping. Now that you understand the RCSJ model, you can very easily understand the behavior of a Josephson junction under microwave radiation. Under such circumstances, the tilted washboard potential will move up and down at the frequency of the microwaves, which is usually of several tens of gigahertz. As the DC bias current is increased, there will be certain current intervals where the motion of the particle will synchronize with the microwave frequency, causing the particle to jump from one metastable minimum to the next in each oscillation period. The latter will result in voltage plateau. As the bias current is further increased, the particle will be able to jump over two potential wells, then three, then four, etc., yielding successive voltage plateaus called Saphiro steps. Such plateaus will depend only on fundamental constants and the excitation frequency, making the Josephson junction an excellent standard for the volt. So far, we have been talking about tunnel junctions. However, there are many other ways of implementing Josephson junctions in the practice. For example, using normal metal, thin layers, or making small constrictions. These kind of junctions do inherently contain a purely ohmic channel for quasi-particle transport, and therefore the RCSJ model is perfectly suited for describing them. Also, if you shunt a tunnel junction with a normal metallic resistor, you will obtain a device well described by the RCSJ model. Adding a low resistor to a steretic junction will allow you to make them reversible. This can be conveniently parametrized by the McCumber parameter beta sub c that relates the critical current of the junction with the resistance of the ohmic channel and the capacitance. Junction having beta c lower than 1 will not be steretic something that is convenient for some applications like squid sensors or single flux quantum logic. In the practice, tunnel junctions are usually fabricated by in-situ oxidation of aluminum. In the quantum technologies community, you will mostly find aluminum tunnel junctions deposited by shadow mask evaporation. Also extended is the use of niobium aluminum oxide niobium three-layer technology used to fabricate micrometric junctions by means of several lithographic steps. Such junctions typically exhibit critical current densities between 100 ampere and up to several kilo ampere per centimeter square at 4 Kelvin. In addition, there are several other weak links between superconducting electrodes capable of exhibiting the Josephson effect. For example, substituting the insulating layer by a normal metal yields Josephson junctions with very high critical current densities of the order of 10 to the 5 ampere per centimeter square at 4 Kelvin. Such junctions are intrinsically shunted, making them non hysteretic but only in very narrow temperature ranges. At very low temperatures, SNS junctions are prone to exhibit thermal hysteresis. Another possibility is to pattern a constriction in a superconductor with dimensions comparable to the coherence length. Such junctions can be fabricated from a single lithography step over a superconducting thin film or by more sophisticated nanopatterning techniques, yielding a three-dimensional constriction. They behave similarly to SNS junctions, also being prone to thermal hysteresis. Unfortunately, these junctions are quite hard to optimize in the practice, but the effort can be worth if you want to use them in combination with large magnetic fields. Finally, Another way of observing the Josephson effect is to exploit the enormously anisotropic properties of high critical temperature superconductors, like caprates. Brain boundaries in YBCO exhibit Josephson behavior with large critical current densities of 10 to the 5 up to 10 to the 6 ampere per centimeter square at 4 Kelvin. These defects can be fabricated from epitaxial growth over a bicrystal substrate or by ion irradiation, with focus ion beams such as helium. At this point, I would like to talk about the first experimental confirmation of the first Josephson equation. 
These experiments were possible by putting one or several Josephson junctions inside a magnetic field. The reason is that magnetic fields allow to induce phase differences in the superconducting condensate and therefore interference effects. In the first experimental demonstration of the Josephson effect, Rowell used one single Josephson junction and the direction of a varying magnetic field to observe a Fraunhofer diffraction pattern in the maximum critical current, similar to the diffraction of coherent light through a single slit. One year later, Jack Levick and co-workers put two junctions connected in parallel, forming a loop inside a varying magnetic field. By measuring the maximum critical current of the device as a function of the external field, they observe a pattern similar to the interference of coherent light passing through a double slit. In the superconducting version, the role of the slits is played by the Josephson junctions, and the phase differences accumulated through different optical paths is produced by the external magnetic field. The experiment performed by Jack Levick and co-workers was the first implementation of a DC squid. Such devices take their names precisely from the interference phenomenon, and for that reason we call them superconducting quantum interference devices. Our analysis of the squid starts with whatever superconducting loop interrupted by one or several Josephson junctions, a circulating current and an externally applied magnetic field. Under such circumstances, there are several sources of phase gradients. First, the Josephson phase accumulated through one, two or several Josephson junctions. Second, the existing circulating current that can be usually neglected if the superconductor are thick enough. And third, the flux thread in the loop. All these phases must sum up to give an integer of 2 pi. When the external magnetic field is not an integer fraction of the flux quantum, the loop compensates this missing phase by means of the Josephson effect. A circulating current will then arise to adjust the phase differences at the edges of the junctions. Let us now consider a typical DC squid configuration, for which we will have two identical Josephson junctions connected in parallel forming a loop, through which we can apply a current and measure a voltage. If the loop has negligible inductance, each junction will need to compensate for a maximum phase change equal to pi half, with sharp phase jumps at half integer values of the flux quantum. For this purpose, a circulating current will develop that must abruptly invert its sign at half integer values of the flux quantum. This circulating current has the effect to reduce the effective maximum critical current that the two parallel junctions can withstand. In this way, the two junction squid can be seen as a single Josephson junction with flux tunable critical current. The maximum modulation results when the loop has negligible inductance. In the practice, real loops are characterized by an inductance with two main sources, geometric and kinetic. The total inductance has the effect of lowering the maximum phase that each Josephson junction needs to compensate. This is to say, the required circulating current lowers, and as a consequence, the modulation of the maximum critical current is decreased. These effects are quantified by the screening parameter beta L. The larger beta L, the smaller the modulation. But the dependence of the squid critical current on the flux has another important consequence. It also affects the Josephson inductance of the device. If the current going through the squid is much smaller than its critical current, which is a good approximation for all applications we will see here, the squid Josephson inductance will become independent of the bias current. Now, the only dependence comes from the inverse of the maximum critical current of the squid, which we know is a function of the external flux. Optimum performance results when flux bias in the system at one quarter of the flux quantum. If you assume that flux variations are small, your squid will behave as a flux tunable inductance characterized by a linear relationship between inductance and flux.